Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about probably the number one thing that really differentiates our career, and that's our manager, and how well we have the mojo with a manager. I'm going to be, we're going to be talking about what makes a great manager better than an okay manager and a bad manager. If you're out there and you've had a bad manager, you know what the issues are. They kind of treat us like tools, interchangeable components. Uh, They blame us for everything that goes wrong. Uh, They really don't support us. They don't get those internal things done that we need. Great comp plans, getting the product fixed, getting support to work, getting paid. All the little nuances of being a rep. But if you get a great manager, uh, somebody who really helps you, protects you, uh, gives you a reasonable territory, a great comp plan, the support that you need that expedites the things internally at the company, that really rocks. That really makes the difference in our jobs and our job satisfaction. And what I've seen is a lot of reps who have had great careers One of the key ingredients is that they have what I call the mafia strategy, where they follow a manager around from job to job, because that manager's got their own career, and they're moving up, and they pull along the great reps. Now, that's a great strategy. So we're going to get into kind of all of these issues about hiring and getting along with your manager, uh, being a great rep, and what makes the difference between a great manager and okay manager. Uh, Before we do, I want to make sure you're checking out CoVideo. CoVideo is the way to connect with your new clients, your prospects, to break through the noise. And yeah, you could cold call if you want. Let me know how that works for you. (laughs) Or you could send a video email, something that would take a little less time, but uh, a little bit of energy, a little bit of creativity, but cuts through all the noise. Let's get into this. And at the very end, I'll sum it up and fill you in on what's going on with the courses. Hey, Joel, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, Brian, thanks for having me. Uh, My name is Joel Passan. I look after global sales at a startup company called Themery. And uh, I've been in um, sort of this kind of interesting intersection of talent and technology as it relates to -to go-to-market and sales for about 25 years now. Yeah. Uh, How'd you get into sales? By way of recruiting, of all things. Yeah. So uh, I started my career as a technical recruiter banging out phone calls um, back in 1998. And uh, I think it could be, recruiting anyway, could be one of the ultimate training grounds for uh, for sellers. Was it 100% commission or? 100%. Oh boy. <laughs> so I, I spent two years as a 100% commission guy. Um, I had a call counter and a stand-up fax machine on my desk. Yeah. And uh, I could not leave my desk until I made 100 cold calls a day. And sent out 25 facsimile-based resumes. So uh, gives you kind of dates me a little bit, Brian. That's okay. I mean, I've got a lot of friends that are in that space, and a lot of them have done insanely well. It's and I, I kind of had the chance to do it early in my career, and I a little bit regret it. <laughs> you know, well, it, I guess it is kind of the ultimate relationship sale, um, but it's tough because y- you know you're in the middle. Well, I always said he had three sales. You have to sell yourself to the candidate. You have to sell your candidate to the company. And you have to sell the hiring manager on the candidate and vice versa. So there may be even more than three sales, but three big buckets. And you're always in the middle. And you have variables that you can't control when you're... And I bet a lot of people didn't give you the full and honest truth either. (laughs) You know, and I, I think, you know, as we talk about some of the topics today around hiring and that sort of thing and, and, and recruiting, uh, being able to deduce arguments yeah. and have these sort of uh, spidey sense instincts, this intuition, uh, proves really handy, not only in sales, but also in recruiting, of course. Well, I, I bet it helped you develop that skill of hiring people because you hear what managers are saying and you hear what candidates are saying. You're looking at a ton of resumes. Um, and, and let's face it, when people look for a job, and this is the issue I always had is you you only look for a job every two to five years. So you're not, it's not something you do every day. And that 
really requires, I think, mo- you know, the, the modern view of things is, and this is something that, you know, kind of taking this back to, you know, sales leadership and, and employers, um, becoming an employer of choice uh, requires marketing these days. I mean, yeah. you can't, you know, it's, you, you have to get extremely lucky. And this is why you have to make a bazillion phone calls as a recruiter. Um, is it's, it's a law of quantity until you get somebody to bite and you have to catch that person on maybe the best day or their worst day is your best day. Yeah. And so now you have very strong feelings about hiring great reps. Did, did you make a few mistakes? Lots of mistakes. I'll, I'll <laughs> give you a, a, well, you know, life, life is about making mistakes and, and trying not to make the same mistakes over and over again. I, I think, you know, as everyone knows, the cliche is that's insanity. Um, but you know, when I, uh, started one of my first companies, uh, I started a, a recruiting firm. So I, I got introduced to recruiting and, uh, was, uh, uh, sort of brash enough earlier in my career to, to start a recruiting company with a, a friend, then friend of mine, a guy named Steve Hazelton. And he and I made lots of mistakes. We would, you know, interview these recruiter people and we'd say to ourselves, wow, I really like this person. I really like this, this woman. She's great. Or this guy. And, um, you know, four or five months later, we found that there were fundamental problems with just this person's work style and their personality that wouldn't lead them to be successful in these jobs. So we made probably 50, 60 of the same types of mistakes over the course of two or three years and then finally got scientific about it. And uh, that led me to, to sort of some of the fundamentals that I use today to hire uh, great, great reps. Well, let's dig into it. Where do you start? I think you have to have a methodology like anything else. So you have to form an opinion and you have to, you have to, harden that and be consistent with it. So my, when you think about how I hire people, um, because I'm in sales, I love alphabet soup. I love acronyms, but, um, I have a methodology and it's something that I've adopted over the years and it's, uh, it's called skip and skip is just a, a stick to itiveness, coachability, intelligence, and you know, somebody having prior success. So S C I P. And then I, I apply that methodology to our vetting process. Um, consistently over and over and over and over again and just do the same thing. And what is your approach? You, you look at the resume. Uh, do you do a phone call first? Do you just skip that part and have a beauty contest parade for a day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just do a, uh, we just do a beauty contest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I'd get hired if that were the case. Like I'd have to. Well, you know, some managers, they do the, the 30 minute um, speed dating type thing. Yeah. Here's what I found. Um, fundamentally, I found that I need to be involved at the very early stages of the process. So um, I work with a, an amazing commercial recruiter uh, in our business today and, and have had the good fortune of working with amazing recruiters. And, and, and what I look for are my recruiters to calibrate uh, generally, you know, I have to have an opinion of what I'm looking for in that particular business. In the business that I'm in today, large enterprise sales, I'm looking for specifically people that have managed large, complex sales to uh, multinational companies, globals. And so we find uh, specifically LinkedIn profiles. Uh, We put those into a system and then I review them and I carve out 30 minutes a day, just like any disciplined salesperson. Um, Recruiting is uh, top one and two priority for me. And so I carve out 30 minutes a day and look at profiles. And when I see a profile that I like, we found uh, significantly higher response rates when I reach out to these people uh, with my email address with a with uh, somewhat of a personalized message. Now, it just so happens we have a product at my company that does that and facilitates it. But even if I hadn't, um, that would be time well spent for me. And I spend 30 minutes a day doing it. And that outreach gets us uh, not only calibrates uh, so I know what is in the top of the funnel for me in the recruiting funnel, but also ensures that we actually are making the connections with uh, the highest priority pe- people at a higher uh, proportional rate because it's it's coming from me. And it doesn't bother you that they're not in market or uh, that they're happily employed or hopefully happily employed? Almost everybody that I've hired um, in the last couple of years has been happily employed somewhere. And, yeah. you know, it's a long tail. I, I have to get out. We've got sales math, much like I'm sure a lot of your leaders in, that listen to your podcast. And so what I have to do is take my sales math. So, for example, I'm hiring for the second half or H2 of 2019 right now and into Q1 of 2020. I look at my sales math and I know that I've got about a 
five month lag going into, uh, I have to start my recruiting now for the next five months so I can hit my sales path. And so and that's a matter of making these connections and, and developing a relationship with these people and uh, being the employer of choice for when maybe they have that bad day or they decide that <laughs> it's it's time to go or their their pipeline is falling apart and it might be opportunistic, but I have to be top of mind for them. So, And why do you do that versus just work mm -hmm. with recruiters? You know, it's like anything else. Uh, if it's important to you, I think you need to own it. And yeah. so in our business, where we're at in our business too, Brian, and where I'm at in at, at Beamery and, 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 and the development of our sales team and in our entire go-to-market motions, um, I want to be personally involved. So we're, I have uh, 11 sales, clear to carrying sales representatives today across three theaters, including uh, EMEA. And I think building those foundations and having the touch points myself early on, especially for the first 30 or 40 sales representatives, sales executives is really, really important to me. Um, you get to shape your team and then you can layer people on top of that and you've built the competency into your team. So the people that take over for me, the, the regional directors and VPs um, can carry on uh, the same sort of methodologies that we use that got us successful with this first foundation. And how do you characterize these people as A players or do you have a, a particular grading system? Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this and share this with you. Uh, and it might not be hyper appropriate. I won't tell anyone. No, if you could, yeah, just pause the uh, recording here if you can. We call them ultra ballers. Yeah. So uh, in my uh, I'm, I'm originally from Cleveland, I'm using a little bit of our slang here, but um, we are looking for, you know, the A players, which is cliche. Um, but we call them, you know, when we look at uh, the people that we want to uh, influence the growth of not only our opportunity pipeline, but our revenue, um, it requires what I refer to, quote unquote, as ultra ballers. And uh, we're we're literally uh, going out and recruiting as if this were almost like a sports team. And there are different roles in different regions that we need to play at different different times. And it's filling in those gaps with uh, the best people we could possibly entice to come to our company. And how do you tell that from a LinkedIn profile? I think that's the first snapshot. Uh, it, it comes back to my methodology. So yeah. I look for people that have some tenure. And you pointed this out with, you know, looking to make a move every two to five years. I look for people that have some stick to itiveness because every sales job's got its up and downs, its peaks and valleys. We all know this. People that can stay through those things thick and thin and get through hard times typically are, uh, will have the personality, uh, the skills, the traits, the character. Uh, to persevere. And so I look for people that have a longer tenure. So there's a method to my madness. And yes, you can tell some things from a LinkedIn profile. You also look at companies where they've sold. In my case, I'm looking for people that have sold complex things to perhaps even un inexperienced buyers. Um, hard to tell coachability from someone's profile. So that's obviously something that we interpret um, and really spend a lot of time on in the interview process. Same thing with intelligence. In fact, we get a little bit uh, scientific with that. I can talk about that. And then you look at prior success. So you look at people not only that have stayed somewhere, but I love when I see a LinkedIn profile, for example, that has, um, you know, numbers on them. People are willing to share some of the quantitative results that they've had uh, at various companies. That's really important to me. So you can tell it a lot from a LinkedIn profile and how it's written. Um, and then the rest is up to you to, to vet or us. Yeah, because, I mean, there's been this huge trend to have the LinkedIn profile not look like a resume. Um, and some people who have adopted that, a lot haven't. And it, you know, and it's still kind of a red flag when a manager sees their reps updating their profile <laughs> that it might be that they're disgruntled. Uh, how about people approaching you? Mm -hmm. uh, what works? What doesn't work? And I'll tell you this. I take all comers and I take uh, – I had this the other day. Um, it was a really timely and it, it's a great question. Um, I think being accessible as a leader is really important. Um, and I have a lot of people reach out uh, via LinkedIn, for example, and say that they're, they've read something that I've written or they've heard me somewhere or they've known somebody that knows me. Um, 
And I always respond to those people and I have a rule. I try to respond to them within 24 hours. I mean, obviously it's the end of the quarter. Well, we're recording this sort of at the end of the quarter and I might be a little bit slower to the switch. Um, but I always try to reach out and I've always had this policy that I get back to everybody and I'm really honest with them. So I had a really accomplished sales leader reach out to me recently. Um, and I tend to look for people that have talent acquisition or HR tech sales experience at the enterprise level. And that I found that uh, we have a much faster ramp. Those people don't have to climb the curve of learning our industry and our product and our process. And I was very honest with this person and that person seemingly appreciated it. And I think as a sales leader, you owe it to people to follow up with them and, and be honest with them and not just drag them along or not just push them to recruiting. Um, so I have sort of a PR policy that I get back to everybody and I try to do so in the most honest way possible. And what if it's gray? What if it's like, uh, it does look like it's a match. I talked to him. Yeah. So I, I set aside, and this comes back to a comment that I made, um, for me. And, and I think this goes with anything. So for example, one of my North star priorities, uh, at Beamery is building a world-class sales team over the next 18 to 24 months. And because that's a North star priority for me, I put time on my calendar and block out times and chunk every week, not just for one-on-ones with my existing reps, um, but for actual recruiting. And so if I find somebody that reaches out to me and it's a gray area, instead of just sort of bantering back and forth via LinkedIn or email, I actually set up a half an hour introductory call. And the first part of that, by the way, I, I kind of flip the script on people. I allow them to do a little bit of discovery on me to self-select into the opportunity and then I, the, the, maybe the the, the final 15 minutes in one of those calls, I ask them some very pointed, consistent questions. Um, and if there's something after that, then we go for it. And, and they can talk to a recruiter, for example, about some of the logistical things that maybe we didn't cover. But I like that initial outreach. I'm a good, uh, and this comes back to my recruiting experience, but I feel like I'm a good frontline person to assess whether or not we're going to spend time from my org on a, on a specific person. And if we're not, we're honest with people. So they can look elsewhere and prioritize their their opportunities as well. And what are some of those questions? Yeah. I mean, the first <laughs> thing that I do uh, is ask people what they think the most important stage of an enterprise sales process is. And I look for a specific answer. Okay. And the other thing that I ask people is I try to get, I ask them their toughest deal ever. What was the toughest deal that you've ever had? Tell me why it was tough explain to me the process. And I try to walk uh, hand in hand with that person through what they went through and try to better understand the deal process because I understand our process for selling our product. And if there are things that are very similar and they've been on those similar journeys over and over again, I know that they've seen the things that we've seen that we want to see in the sales process and they'll know how to navigate them. And a good salesperson to me is like a good navigator on a ship or uh, a co-pilot, for example, in an airplane uh, that can read the wind. <laughs> they can read uh, all the meters and the dials to understand that logically there is a deal or a project here that is closable rather than people that have happy ears and big hearts that oftentimes miss some of those cues. Yeah. Are, are you finding that there's a lot of salespeople out there that you know do the traditional uh, show up, present, demo, propose – and then hound to death versus the people who know how companies buy and how to usher the order through the process. The latter is definitely yeah. <laughs> uh, the, mi the, mi the minority and not the majority. And I'll tell you why it's not. If you look at the, the economics of the market, there've been billions and billions and billions of dollars of, of investment put into um, business software space and the need for salespeople to sell business software has become prevalent, um, yeah. you know, pretty astronomical. And not all of those people are selling a product uh, uh, that requires uh, a large enterprise, in-depth, value-based sales process. And I'm looking for the latter. I'm looking for those people. And so I have to sort of sift through the folks that, you know, they're probably really good at selling something that's on a flywheel. Um, and not saying, not diminishing those people at all. I've worked in a business like that. That's a fun business. But in this <laughs> specific business, I... I you don't have that. Yeah. I don't have it. I don't have that luxury. That's it. And I think that's what I 
typically found too. And it's, it's disappointing because not only do they not know how to do it, they assume that they don't have to do it, that they have a market with poll interest and, you know, a set number of alternatives. And they basically not order taking, but order yeah. concierge. And that's Big very different. To it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's something else that you, you know, you can extrapolate from that. And, comes back to one of the questions you asked me earlier, you know, can you tell somebody, you know, can you get a sense of someone from their LinkedIn profile? You can because you can see where they've been. So for example, there are a couple of, of companies that I specifically look for people from, um, maybe not where they work today at this specific company, but they've done a, a, a stint, you know, a couple of years selling something that's got a pretty nascent value proposition. Yeah. And if they've done that for two or three years and been fairly successful there, I know that person is... Uh, somebody that can create value and share and articulate vision and has had that experience. And I look for that. I think that's a really powerful skill. Uh, that's it. Cause I did mostly startups in my career. And when I'd interview with a VP that came from a portfolio company uh, that was more of account management and there's still a sale to it, but there's a brand and there's tons of support and there's mm -hmm. a pipeline and you go into a startup that's you know probably on their A or B round, you know, around ten, less than twenty million. Um, you know, and, and that, that person would be new. I go, this is a disaster. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because they. Well, they QBR you to death, and, <laughs> and it's going to be your fault. Of course. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I I I've alluded to this in in a couple of my my responses, but I have to get on the phone today with people, get on a call and tell them, listen, you're going to have to demo our product. Uh, we're really thin on, uh, for example, solution consulting resource. We don't have a bunch of sales engineers. They're going to set up environments for you and basically do your job for you and demo. You have to learn this product. Um, you're going to have to work uh, alongside of, you know, product people um, and, and even founders at this and, 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 founder level and other executives, our CS leader, for example, to bring them into deals in stage two or three. And you have to be super hands-on. So you have to be the quarterback. You have to be the deal architect. You have to be running all of these things. And occasionally you have to be the sales engineer. So I find myself even playing some of those roles with our sellers when they ask me to join calls and I'll say, what's our agenda? And they're like, yeah, can you talk about the workday integration? <laughs> and I have to know what the API payload <laughs> Yeah. schema looks like and you know everybody's got to carry their weight here so that actually adds some complexity to my recruiting and i have to come and be upfront with these people because not everybody who's worked at a an oracle has had to play all of those different roles in the last three or four years of their career especially a senior person so um to some extent that that creates challenges in our recruiting process too and that's it because they have to be able to hold a conversation not just about the slide deck that, you know, they have to understand the problem, what their clients are facing, uh, find a way of keeping momentum with the deal that's just not a demo. And that's a, it's rare today. Comes back to those. I think that sales has a couple of curves. If you look at it holistically, you've got the curve of understanding your own value proposition and product. You have a curve of understanding your industry and the ICP that dominates your industry. And you have the curve of understanding your own sales process um, at a new company. And so when you're recruiting, this comes back to my methodology, you have to find somebody with a fair amount of cognitive strength uh, to be able to process all of those different things. You can't just plug somebody into the cockpit and say, hey, pull this lever three times. If the altitude gets over this, pull this thing down and it will release the flaps. They have to really fundamentally understand everything about the plane, everything about the wind speed and everything about the route that they're taking. And that's hard. That, that requires cognitive, um, sophistication. Yeah. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Yeah. And because I talk to people like yourself all day long and I, I hear from other people that all these sales jobs are going away. Now I've been hearing this my whole career. Yeah. Right. But I never talk to a sales leader who goes, you give me a, an A player or a super baller, I will yeah. find budget to hire that person. So you bring up an interesting thing that could be another topic in and of itself. Um, 
I don't think sales, it's just like recruiting. There are a bunch of recruiting companies out there, you know, technology companies that want to automate recruiting (laughs) and recruiting. If we go back to the top of the meeting, top of the call here, um, you know, it's a fairly, it's very much like sales. Are you going, you can't automate relationships. Now you can, you know, I, I look at artificial intelligence. Um, we can mine more information. We can get more data to help with our blueprinting. Um, but I look at AI in our world as enterprise sales leaders is augmented intelligence. What can you automate for me that's going to make me more intelligent and give me more data, data points uh, at an inflection point where I have to make a decision? I believe in that, but I don't believe in salespeople going away. Not at not at the enterprise or B two B business software layer. I just don't see it. And and you know, obviously, I'd go on record saying that. But um, and and if you look, you know, when you see a market segment or category develop, yeah. I always look at how are they selling, not just marketing, not just the product. Who has the the enterprise sales organization? And I've I've been pretty accurate on who will win. Because a lot of them, you know, they want to save money on sales. They'll only do inside. And I've had the CEO on the podcast. And after the call was over, I go, if you really want to win this space, you've got to build a sales organization. Oh, the margins aren't there. And I go, well, <laughs> they are for your competitor, you know. Well, without saying names, I mean, and there's a couple of these in the Bay Area. Um, no, there's a lot, yeah. <laughs> but there seems to be sometimes this dissonance between – uh, founders who say, I don't want to create a sales organization because of the margins, um, you know, it'll, it'll, uh, we're a technology company. Um, and you find that about two to three years into their run, they realize that, oh my gosh, we need a sales organization and it needs to be world-class. And I, I feel like everybody's come to that realization. Now, the only anomaly that I can think of, and they've even changed is Slack. Um, yeah, I mean, you you will get an interesting the, example. Yeah, that has a network effect uh, that's more consumer based. You know, the box was there. Yep. But if you look at, at a lot of them, uh, and, and it's really not the founders' fault either. Sometimes it's the the VCs will not today invest that much in a B two B company that requires an enterprise sales force. They don't understand it. It's expensive. It's time consuming. But without it, um, how much control do you really have? Don't. You don't control your destiny. You leave it You leave it to the whim of the market. Yeah. Um, it, you, you know, know having w- spent some time in the VC world, too, it's interesting to watch uh, peers where I was evaluating pitches that came through. And one of the things that we would get a partner uh, – coworker of my colleague play and everybody would walk out of the room who was pitching and they would say, Oh, that's not, you know, we're going to have to build a huge sales team to sell that. And I'd be like, okay, that's an advantage. And others in the others in the meeting would say, absolutely don't, we don't want to touch that. And by the way, that CEO doesn't, isn't an operator yet. And will struggle for years to figure that out unless they get somebody like a CRO in there very quickly. And we don't see that happening. And so that's, there's also a fundamental issue with, you know, Sierra is not wanting to join a company uh, at a certain size because there's no product to sell. And by the time that there is a product to sell, there's not enough equity in the deal to lure a CRO to move the needle. And so there's there's a little bit of this chicken and the egg thing going on in the VC slash enterprise sales, enterprise B2B space that it definitely is affecting how companies are getting funded and who's joining them. Yeah, because, I mean, there's not that many – great ones around there's huge demand and the life expectancy isn't very long and mm-hmm. they really want to hire a magician not a cro <laughs> you know, so, this is true you know you have to leave your you have to leave your wand in the car when yeah. you interview these days. cool hey it's been a great conversation uh, tell us about what you're doing today and how people can get in touch with you absolutely I am, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm the head of global sales at a company called Beamery. And, and what we do, essentially, uh, quickly, is uh, help companies, enterprise companies, uh, be more proactive about uh, culling and, and creating their talent uh, pools uh, and transforming their talent DNA uh, over the course of you know 24, 36 months uh, to where their business is heading. So it's talent CRM, talent marketing. And I'm easy to get a hold of. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my profile is right there. I'm also Jay Passon on Twitter. Um, 
I'm, I'm an easily found guy and I'm looking for sales enablement, sales engineers, global account executives. And uh, I appreciate your time today. It's always good to get different perspectives on our sales career. And I think we overlook this when we're going in for an interview. Uh, we we kind of see if do we get along with the manager, but what's their style? How hands-on are they? What do you need from them? Are you the type of person that needs to check in several times a day, or do you like to be left alone? Um, I've had a couple of good managers, maybe one or two great managers, but I've had a lot of terrible managers, ones that uh, just had no clue how to lead or even manage. They just kind of uh, would try and take over and hijack deals. Uh, they would end run you. They would throw you under the bus. Uh, they wouldn't protect you. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to even things out. And I even saw this comment on LinkedIn about evening out the, uh, the normal distribution curve. And it's like, do you not understand it's a normal distribution curve? The fact is you can't even it out. And when you try to, what you're doing is hurting the good people to help the bad in this Robin Hood approach to management uh, to make them look better because it, it doesn't look good when one person kicks it or knocks it out of the park, it makes everybody else look bad. But that's the nature of nature <laughs> in that you have outliers on both the good side and the bad. And the manager's job is get rid of the bad ones, uh, make the good ones better, and leave the good ones alone or support them. Uh, get them the great comp plan and understand that that is what you want. It's not what you don't want. And to convince management uh, that they're worth the money. They're creating income. They're creating revenue. And that's why you hired them. Don't just give them a bigger quota in a smaller territory, trying to handicap them back to the middle of the curve. That is not a solution. That's the problem. And I love talking to great managers because when you get a great sales manager, hang on. And if they can keep going from company to company. And I've had a, a bunch of friends who kind of did that mafia strategy and it worked. They went to the best companies. They got the best comp plan. They got the best amount of equity. And every three to five years, they would move on to the next one. And they kind of stuck together like a, a den of thieves. But it was all legit, of course. There's nothing wrong with it. It's actually ideal. And, you know, I've done it with different people like system engineers or software engineers that would move along with me and consultants. And you'd move from company to company. But I never had it on the management side. And, uh, you know, I've had CEOs hire me. But usually they got to have the right jobs. Uh, usually when a, a VP of sales gets into a CEO position, it's not exactly the premier company. It's a turnaround. And uh, you could always do well. And if you have a great manager, they really protect you and get you a great comp plan, a great territory, give you the upside and the independence that you need. So it, it's key to make sure that you're really looking at the manager as much as the company as much as the territory and the comp plan, because if you don't get along, if it's a mismatch, if it's a conflict, you're going to lose. A lot of reps think they're naive enough to think that they can get rid of the manager. And I've seen it happen. Not too often, though. So I don't think that's a good strategy. Hey, uh, make sure you're checking out CoVideo. Get your video email game working. And if you're in the courses, make sure you're checking out office hours. I Those are every other week. And schedule one-on-ones. You have unlimited one-on-ones, 30-minute Zoom call with me where we apply the course to a particular situation that you're trying to get into. Uh, I did a great one-on-one -on -one, uh, this week, so you might want to check that out in the course. It's the second to the last chapter. If you're interested in taking your sales game to the next level, guess what? Are you going to do it on your own? You need some kind of routine. You need to start understanding the game that you're playing. You need to get it out of your head and onto paper. You need to understand the, the nuances, the elements, and the smarter ways of doing things. Look, you, you just hit the end of one quarter. You're going into another one. How's it going? 
Would you like to talk to somebody? Would you like to hear other people getting coached up, getting uh, discussing their deals, unstucking them, preventing the bad things from happening, and ensuring the good things do happen? That's what they're all about. Go to b2brevenue.com right now. Schedule a time to talk it over. Uh, there's two major courses. They both have the same uh, structure, the content. You get 100% access to it day one. You go at your pace. You start any time. And then you have office hours, which is a Q&A group meetup every other Friday. Uh, bring your questions. Bring your case studies. Uh, dig into it deeper. Uh, see how other people are doing it. And then you have unlimited one-on-ones with me. Isn't that fun? Imagine that. Chatting it up with me. <laughs> we get on Zoom uh, for about 30 minutes and we talk over a particular deal that you're trying to get into or a deal you're trying to close. Uh, and we sh- walk you through the course and how to apply it and how to solve a particular sticking point that you have. Everything's recorded and put into the course anonymously. No one knows your name, your company, your product, your customer. Don't need to know it. We need to solve the particular issues. Uh, you, the individual issues we don't record. We can do it before and after I turn the recorder on. That's it. Appreciate everybody's time. Make sure you're checking out the other two podcasts, the Sales Questions, uh, Brutally Honest Answers podcast, a daily podcast that I put out. Uh, drops about 7.30 a.m. Eastern time every morning. Uh, I answer all your questions. If you have a question, just go to LinkedIn. Send me a little in-mail there with a the question. I answer as many as I can every week. What else? The B2B Revenue Leadership Show. Are you checking that out? If you want to get into management, want to see what they're talking about, make sure you're checking that show out and follow the podcast company page on LinkedIn uh, where I have uh, little snippets and videos. And I appreciate anybody who tells another rep about the brutal truth. We'll see you next time.